Marty Bernstein forgot his tie. Do you know who Marty Bernstein is? Oh, you know? Okay. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking of that's so match. <laughs> that make noise, if you feel <coughs> please remember to please silence them so they don't disturb the humor. <laughs> Once the contest has begun, the surgeon at arms will secure the doors. <coughs> Members of the audience are advised to refrain from leaving or entering the room during the contest. You may do so if need be, but please, at the break, at the minute of silence. After the contest, please do not stand up, do not make noise until all the ballots have been collected. Here is the speaking order for the humorous speech contest. Contestant number one, George Sweeney. George Sweet, contestant number one. Contestant number two, Jay Halim. J. Halim, contestant number two. Contestant number three, Latrice Ford. Latrice Ford, contestant <coughs> number three. Contestant number four, Brian Cunty. Brian Cunty, contestant number three. And yes, almost. <laughs> contestant number five, Deidre Blair. Deidre Blair, contestant number five. Contestant number six, Miles and Collins. Miles and Collins, contestant number six. There will be one minute of silence between each contestant. Timers. Please give me a signal when one minute of silence is start. <coughs> we will now begin the Humorous Speech Conference. <laughs> George Sweet, I've got a secret. I've got a secret. George Sweet. Toastmasters and guests, I've got a secret. I'm a spy. I know you wouldn't think of it to look at me, but really, my name, my alias, should have given it away, Mr. Sweet. <laughs> I mean, personally, I think that's one of the best parts of, of being a spy, is I get to come up with aliases. Like when I was a high school coach by the name of Jim Shorts, <laughs> or that bean counter by the name of Adam Ami. <laughs> or when I was that Irish dentist by the name of Phil O'Donto. <laughs> I often go undercover as a customer service rep. I know it doesn't sound very glamorous, but really think about it. I'm on the phone, I get a lot of information from people that way. So if you're ever on the phone with a service rep, and maybe their name is Kurt Reply, <laughs> or Levon Hold, <laughs> or maybe Xavi Your Breath. <laughs> There's a good chance you're on hold with me. I know that in the movies it's always Bond, James Bond. Always the same name. The guy's got no imagination. <laughs> I mean, I love it when I'm undercover as a, a lumberjack by the name of Tim Burr. <laughs> or when I went undercover as a Japanese sous chef by the name of Benny Honda. <laughs> but my favorite, my favorite was when I was a yodeling instructor by the name of Leo Del Leahy. And boy, would I laugh anytime somebody said, Leo Del Leahy who? <laughs> Picture, but I will show you some pictures of me, some real pictures of me on one of my missions. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about is one of my latest missions. It was very exciting. I saved the world. What I did was we found out there was a plot from these terrorists 
to, to steal a new, uh, they had stolen the plans <coughs> of the nuclear bomb, it was my job. The way they were sneaking it out of the country was by breaking it up and putting it on these tiny little, I think I have some here I can show you. These tiny little CDs, these miniature CDs. <laughs> and it was my job to collect as many of these as possible. <coughs> well, obviously, I can't be shipping these home one at a time every time I collect one. So I got this shirt that the government gave me with envelopes hidden in the vents of the pockets. These envelope vents, or events as we call them. <laughs> <laughs> You're jumping ahead. <laughs> Um, were perfect as I would collect them as I'd go around on each mission and, and stick my my CD or the CDs into this event. And this one one adventure of the many, I was traveling all over. I had to fly into this tiny little country and get into. I don't know if any of you ever ridden in a tuk tuk. <laughs> it's a really tough. Well, there they call it a sedan. But, uh, <laughs> I literally saw entire families riding in it. <laughs> But so I ride in this little tuk-tuk up into the mountains. The only way to get up there, as high as the road will go. From there, I had to climb the rest of the way to the top of this mountain. <laughs> and all the time, just to get to the top of the mountain was just so that I could get on a zip line and zip across this deep ravine, deep into the jungle, where I had to battle with fierce <laughs> animals. Like this, like this boa constrictor. I don't, I don't know why I'm smiling in this picture. I'm sure it's just nervous laughing. It was, it was quite a battle. And that wasn't even the worst of it. I had to tackle a tiger and wrestle it to the ground. Okay, I know what you're thinking at this point. There's another phony picture. This is not really him. But check out the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I had my events with me. I had, to I had to sneak into the cave and knock that tiger out to get in there and get my seat. And so I did that. Collected all these miniature discs, put them in my events, headed back to headquarters where I was lauded with praise. George, you did a great job. You saved the world again. <laughs> again. <laughs> but they said, you can never tell anybody. Well, that would be a shame. I said, I went to my boss and said, well, hypothetically, just hypothetically, I've got a group of friends I want to tell this to. Those Toastmasters, they love a good story, and, and I'm sure they'll all keep it to themselves. You've got to keep this all to yourself. He said, what if, I, what if I just told them about it? And he said, George, you know what? He knows me by my first name, George. He says, George, you know what? Go ahead and tell them. Nobody is ever going to believe that strange sequence of your events. <laughs> and you know what? You may have been right, but that's my story. Thank you. Jay Halim, Big Mac Stack, Big Mac Stack, Jay 
Halim. Good evening, fellow Toastmaster, honored guests. My name is Jay Halim, and the title of my speech is Big Mac Stack. Have any of you been to McDonald's lately? Have you heard of their slogan, I'm loving it? Ba -da -ba -ba -ba, I'm loving it. <laughs> well, I want to share with you a story, an experience that we had when I was five. It was with my aunt and myself. It was a bright, sunny afternoon with the clouds in the formation of a Big Mac and <laughs> the, the French fry smell area close to McDonald's grabbed my attention. So we decided to grab something to eat before school. And it's kind of funny how certain places like McDonald's are very nostalgic in creating an experience in which you look back to and always have a consistent area in your life while the evolution of life occurs. And we walked in and we got a Big Mac. And my question was, how many bites does it take to get to the center of the Big Mac? <laughs> and I was thinking, maybe we'll run some big data analysis on the Big Mac. Or maybe I should know this already because I've had maybe 150 Big Macs. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's nice to see that a Big Mac is stacked the same way as it was when it was launched in the 1950s, and really hasn't changed. When you look at the Big Mac, it's almost as if home is where the heart is. And where's the heart in the Big Mac? Is it stacked in between the two golden patties, the lettuce, tomatoes, onions, pickles, or a special sauce? In my opinion, I believe it is a special sauce. And the reason I think it is a special sauce is because that taste really hasn't changed since I was five years old. And, and that leads me to my second point in McDonald's. What if a value meal three meets a value meal two? So I'm on this health food kick, and I went to the drive-thru menu. I went through the drive-thru like I normally do, and for some reason there was like 50 cards. There's always so many people around the McDonald's I go to, so and they're all on their cell phones, so I guess they must be busy. So I go inside, <laughs> right? I go inside the McDonald's, and we have like 50 people in line also, it's always really busy. So because of my health kick, I'm deciding what should I get? Because they changed the menu on me. So I'm trying to understand, am I going to stick with a Big Mac? <laughs> or should I go with the Caesar salad or the wrap? And it just dawned on me. What if the value meal number two meets the value number meal number three? with how we're getting efficient, with the time we have, would it be easier to stack the Caesar salad onto the Big Mac <laughs> with your dessert? And maybe throw some, some Diet Pepsi on it? <laughs> into a, into a, say, a new value meal? I don't know. However, what I do know is there's a McDonald's on every corner and you can always count on the consistency of McDonald's. And just like when you're a kid and you have certain aspirations and certain visions, it's 
always good to keep that consistent throughout your life, just like the McDonald's arches, great and golden. Because as the world changes, some consistency is needed because dreams do come true and we can always count on the stack of the big one because from the ground up, you're solid with the golden layer bun, <laughs> vegetables, and you have some protein, and it's not going to change in our migration or evolution. Thank you. <laughs>
See, I don't have that eight no more. <laughs> well, really, I never have it anyway. <laughs> so what is a girl to do? What can I do? Sometimes I'm going to say, hey, choose me. Hey, choose me. Look at me. <laughs> but you don't want to be so <laughs> desperate. <laughs> Don't be desperate. Don't settle for just anyone. Sure you want a guy, sure you want a man, but just don't settle. See, the inside counts too. And the reason why the inside counts too, you need to know what's on the inside of someone. Are they trustworthy? I don't want to go back through that again. I want to do that. Another speech, another speech. <laughs> Can they endure you losing a job? Can they endure, oh yeah, I have four children. Can they endure, and four grandchildren. <laughs> so can they endure some of the things that might happen as you will pass the age of, I'm going to tell you, pass the age of 50, four, okay, yeah, 49, yeah, pass the age of 50. Past the age, I have friends who've never been married, getting ready to turn 60. So I try to encourage them and say, look on the inside of you. Because first, you must love yourself. See, the inside counts too, because the inside will come outside. And you need to know what's on the inside of you and what's on the inside of someone else. The inside Very important. Did you look and see? Did you not get play again? <laughs> Did you look and see that it's going to be someone who cares for you? See, I thought maybe somebody will find me in a scenario or go something like this. Oh, we bought a little home in the country, little woods over here, little five, six acres. <laughs> yeah, I want some acres. <laughs> And we're asleep, and I say, I want to cook this great, fantastic breakfast. So I run down the stairs, get in and there. He comes downstairs because he hears something, and then he starts screaming, ah, ah, I scream, ah. I say, what are you screaming for? Oh, he saw me without the makeup on. <laughs> Brian Candy, getting lucky, getting lucky, Brian Candy. In the summer of 1996, 
I stepped onto campus in Ann Arbor a free man. Not so much free like a bird, but free like a convict out of prison. <laughs> Four years of all boys Catholic high school as an introvert with skin problems did not exactly win me very many ladies. <laughs> Who am I kidding? It did not win me a single lady. <laughs> But this was a new world. This is a how we met story. Do you have a how we met story? How you met a significant other? Do you have two how we met stories? <laughs> the one is about church, and the other one's some late night awkward blind date first thing. Oh. You usually don't tell that story. Well, tonight I'm going to tell that awkward story. And maybe you're asking, Brian, why would you tell that story in front of so many people? And the answer is, I didn't know there would be so many people. <laughs> <laughs> but the real answer is, I needed some material. <laughs> and you all know how hard it can be to come up with good material. So let's get started. <laughs> I was six inches too short and 75 pounds too light to ever be very good at rowing. I was the Rudy of our crew team on college. One day after practice, I stood there in a pair of black spandex and old white cotton t-shirt just drenched with sweat, talking to my teammate, John. From the moment John had told me that he was from Chicago, it all seemed to make sense. He had that kind of social awareness and the coolness about him that the rest of us just didn't have. And I imagine that he had honed that while growing up on the city streets. But later, when I moved here myself, I realized that when John said Chicago, he meant Winneka. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, he was the badass from Winneka. <laughs> he had a tattoo. <laughs> Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a coxswain, Molly, approaching. And this was my big chance. You know what? We'll, let's stop there. Uh, this is the division contest. I want this to be like a total scene immersion. I want to put you guys right there. <laughs> Somebody may be asking if there's a way to escape this scene. <laughs> I'm sorry, but Prez has the doors locked. <laughs> and others might be realizing now why you have to be 12 years old or older to attend tonight. <laughs> Honey, cover your eyes. There's a man in spandex on stage. Okay, let's take it from the top. I was six inches too short and 75 pounds too light to be very good at rowing. I was the Rudy of our crew team in college. And as I stood there with my badass friend John <laughs> in a pair of black spandex and white cotton t-shirt and dripping with sweat. <laughs> they warned me about the electrical outlets here. <laughs> I noticed out of the corner of my eye a coxswain Molly approaching. Molly had dark hair, beautiful freckled skin, and these amazing bright blue eyes. And on top of that, she was funny and smart. And this was my big chance. Now, you may say there's probably a lot of great pickup lines that you could have used at that moment. But remember, I was a convict. Recently released. <laughs> and this was like interviewing for a CEO position. <laughs> so I could have used the line like, haven't we met before? Or, hey baby, what's your name? <laughs> I could have used a more mundane line like, hey, how's it going? <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> I could have used one of those lines, but the line I chose to use was, I wouldn't get too close. I smell really bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I imagine there are only three reasons 
why Molly didn't walk away right that moment. <laughs> the first reason was my friend John. He laughed it off and he played it cool like I was actually trying to make a joke. And I was thankful for his time as a gang leader in Humble Park. <laughs> <laughs> the second reason was my honesty, I'd like to think. I did smell really bad. <laughs> Laundering your spandex on the crew team was considered a great sign of weakness. <laughs> we never let those things near soap or water. We preferred to air dry them. <laughs> and after a couple of months of that treatment, you could smell the boat going up and down Argo Pond. <laughs> and the third reason, and probably the most important, was pure and utter luck. Have you ever been handed something and all you had to do was one thing right? Mm. <laughs> That's a confirmation. <laughs> mm. And you messed up even that one thing? That's what I did. But someone must have been looking down on me that day because Molly stayed and talked to us and the rest is history. After 10 years of marriage, looking back on that day, I realized that I was very lucky. And I'm reminded of a quote <coughs> by Lefty Gomez. It says, I'd rather be lucky than good. Adrian Blair, smooth operator. <laughs> smooth operator, Adrian Blair. So 
something I think we can all relate to is high school dances. They had sock hops. We had the homecoming dance. And how many of you remember that one big dance we all wanted to go to? What was it? Wow. No, the house party. <laughs> we all wanted to go to the house party. Because if you were invited to the house party, that meant you were someone special. But you better have your own unique style when you went to the house party. My style was my jeans, and at that time, I wore an afro. Mm. <laughs> my jeans, the crease were so, was so sharp, it could cut diamonds. <laughs> and my hair, you see, my afro had to be perfectly round. So I had my own unique style of styling my afro. <laughs> I would take a scarf, put it on my head, and tie it. And I would pat, and I would pat, and when I took the scarf off, bam, it was perfectly round. <laughs> Ladies, I know you can relate to how we all would stand in a huddle over in the corner at the house party, and we would size up all the guys. Oh, girl, look at him. He is so cute. Oh, my God, he is the coolest. I want to dance with him. And guys, I know you remember standing up against the wall, trying to figure out how am I going to ask one of them to dance. <laughs> At one of the parties, this boy came in the door, and oh, he was the finest, the coolest I had ever seen. He walked in, and he definitely had his own unique style of dress, the way he wore his hair. And I even saw keys dangling from his pocket. <laughs> he had a car. <laughs> well, while the girls huddled in the corner and they began to cackle about, ooh, I'm going to be the one to dance with him. No, it's not you. It's me he's going to choose. I had a strategy. I ignored him. Turned my head as if I did not see him mm. come in the door. And sure enough, I saw him walk across the floor. He was so cool, he didn't even speak. He just held out his hand. <laughs> I winked at my girlfriends and followed him out to the dance floor. <laughs> now then, we had a dance that was very popular. It was called the bop. It required that you had a partner. They would step forward, step back, and then they would spin you around and then you would bop. My favorite bop song came on. It was called Mighty Love by the Spinners. A mighty love will sometimes make a, a weak man strong. And so we stepped forward, we stepped back, and he spun me around. But as I turned, my girlfriends were in the corner laughing and pointing. And I thought, what in the world are they laughing at? until I turned around and O-M-G. <laughs> he had a tooth missing. <laughs> but he could dance. <laughs> I finished the song. I finished the song and then I made my excuses and went back to the corner. As an adult, I still like to dance. And I wanted to take a class in stepping. Have anyone in here ever heard of stepping. It's a smooth dance, and like the bop, you had to have a partner. So I went to a class, and soon, after I learned the eight count step, I developed my own unique style, and I began to step. It was smooth. One day, our instructor called everyone to the front of the room, and he said, you know, I've been dancing for over 25 years and won several stepping contests. I can definitely teach you how to dance, but if you want to know how to be cool, if you want to have the swagger, you've got to look at Deidre. <laughs> That's when I became a smooth operator. <laughs> now for you, it may not be dancing. What is it about you, that one unique style that you have, that makes you stand out from the rest? Maybe you like George, 
who has events. <laughs> or maybe you're like the press who has a unique speaking quality to win the world championship. I don't know what it is, but I encourage you to get your own unique style. Then you can too be the smooth operator. Madison Collins, unlikely good advice from my uncle. Unlikely good advice from my uncle, Madison Collins. The date was set. My grandmother's peach cobbler pie permeated the room. Everyone gathered around the table that night. So that way we can have one final dinner before my grandmother's special person came home. Her son, my uncle. His name was Bird. He had been gone for over 20 years. There was about 10 different conversations going on in the room that night, but they all subsided to listen to my grandmother give a toast. Thank God my boy is coming home! <laughs> Master Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests, I'll never forget her speech that night. She looked me square in the eye and said, boy, Bird has got some good stuff to teach you tonight when he come <laughs> home now. I was excited. I was only 20 years old at the time. I had never met my uncle at that point. I had only heard about him from the stories that my older brothers and sisters used to tell me about him. My grandmother said, you know what? I want to see him before he comes home. So the very next morning, <coughs> she took me and all of my brothers and sisters to see him. I was excited. In my mind, I could just see it, because I thought he was some huge, successful guy. He was going to be tall, have a dark pinstripe suit. He was going to be so successful, he was going to brush people out the way to give us a hug when we came to see him. When I came back to reality, the car came to a screeching stop. I looked out the window. I saw two armed guards in front of a steel 15-foot gate. And on the top it said, Illinois State Prison? <laughs> what? This is no Harvard. <laughs> I started staring at the back of my grandmother's ear hole. For about five seconds, I then began to question her like I was trying to get her to join the class action lawsuit. Grandmother, did someone put some liquor in your teeth? <laughs> are you going crazy? What are we doing here? Boy, shut up. Now y'all know we're going inside the jail, so don't bring nothing sharp. No money, no liquor. <laughs> well, you know, we definitely gonna need our organ on the car because we're going inside the jail. We're all gonna, gonna get killed. <laughs> Unbelievable. My grandmother warned me not to mention anything about my uncle's eye. He had one eye and he had 50% vision in that eye. By the time we got inside the jail, I stared at my uncle and was like, was this the guy she was telling me gonna teach me something? I was upset. And on top of that, you named him after an animal. Looking at him, he should have been named something like bear or buffalo, not bird. <laughs> Nonetheless, she told me it had been 20 years since we would seen each other. I was only a baby when I first saw him. I, sit, I sat down on the stool, stared at him behind the bulletproof glass. I could only muster two words. Hey, uncle. I didn't know the guy. I don't think I really wanted to. Two weeks had passed. My uncle had finally came home. So I took the responsibility and said, hey, I'll take care of this guy. Never did I think it was going to be like raising a child coming back and said, 
to society. Uncle, hey, don't do that with the sink. Uncle, hey, don't do that with the pot. Uncle, that's not how you cook bacon. You actually have to fry the bacon. You don't get to eat the bacon. <laughs> <laughs> they get everything raw in jail, needless to say. <laughs> so I said, you know, let me do a little Q&A with my uncle. Uncle, how was life? How was your eye? He got very upset. So we got to a little tussling match. He said, Milison, I hate you. <laughs> Never get into a tussle of that, ladies and gentlemen, the guy who's been in jail for over 20 years. He has jailhouse muscle. And totally different. My, brother, my grandmother brought me in the room and warned me, Milison, don't tussle with him. By the time I came back out, he had already took it off his shirt. I was ready to fight when I saw his body. I said, you know what? Uncle, give me up. <laughs> I decided, you know, maybe he has some tension. He been locked up for 20 years. So I invited him out to the lounge. Figure, get around people, get him laughing, he would have a great time. Got him at the bar, sat him down, got him a drink, he said, Uncle, be yourself. If you need to pick up a girl, use a pickup line. They'll love you, just be yourself. For the next hour and a half, all I heard was, I only have one eye, but I got a future and I can see you in it. <laughs> 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 then, I turned around and I saw a very nice looking young lady. I looked around and I thought, wow, that was my turn to come up with a pickup line. And every guy in the room can attest to this. You see a lovely young lady, you walk up to her, and you get your male deep voice going, hey, what's up? <laughs> your name is? Dead silence. The woman didn't say anything to me. My uncle's laughing at me. So I try again with the surefire pickup line that always worked. Hey, baby, you must be tired because you've been running the line all day. Dead silence with this guy's real look. By this point, I was complete entertainment to everybody at the bar with all of my failed pickup lines. My uncle was behind me laughing, saying, Is he trying to sound like the Batman guy? I was gassed. <laughs> So my third attempt, I figured, why not just be myself? But a huge ball of spit, right when I was going to come out, came barreling through my gap. Boom! Landed dead on the forehead. <laughs> <laughs> that got <her> talk. <laughs> talk about an awkward moment. I took my hand, wiped it off, and I said, the only thing I can think of, you have to excuse my gap. It has an uncanny ability to fire rear objects out of my mouth with just a moment's notice. <laughs> just before I do it, she noticed my uncle. My uncle stands up and says, you don't have to prove yourself to her. Wait, uncle, listen. Listen, calm down. Before I cut your ankle bracelet off, you go back to bed. <laughs> he, he gets upset again. He swings like that. He hits her and knocks her out. <laughs> and she gets right back up. And she's looking at me. She wants me to beat him up. And I said, uncle. Give me up. <laughs> <laughs> she looks at me and she returns the favor. She spits on my forehead and walks out the door. <laughs> uncle, let's go home. I was hurt. My uncle had been locked up for 20 years, but he told me one very important lesson in life. He said, Milesen, always be yourself. Be honest to people. You don't have to lie to anyone to you know, get them to like you. They're going to like or hate you whether you know you are or who you're not. If a girl asks you, my son, what do you do for a living? Tell her that you live with roaches. <laughs> Tell her that you live with your grandmother. Tell her that you're ugly because it's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Uncle. My uncle to this day has since passed away. And I would like to thank my uncle for that advice because now to this day I'm glad to say I am who I am. Thank you.
let's get to know our contestants. I would like to welcome all the contestants on the stage and please line up in an order in which you spoke. Conversation with anyone you speak with. Very good. Can you guess what's his favorite quote? I'm loving it. I'm loving it! <laughs> <laughs> Extreme 
Toastmasters for two years. <laughs> now you know why people laugh, they're all, they all laugh. <laughs> uh, and I, I think I just got my CC, or I have enough to finally get it. No. Your wife is in the audience tonight. Yes. What's the feeling of speaking in her presence? <laughs> Does that put some extra pressure on the already existing pressure on the stage? Yeah, I'd say so. And that, you know, especially in like an embarrassing story, I try to hide those so she doesn't see that kind of stuff. I see how you hide it. You bring her up there. <laughs> <laughs> what keeps you coming back to those? I think uh, at first, just going Toastmasters was like, I just dragged myself there. But after a while, it's actually enjoyable to get up in front of the audience and just see how people improve. I like to see the new people come in and improve. And the people that have been doing it for so long keep refining their craft. Well, Brian, thank you very much for participating. Thanks. President of Public Relations, yes. what's the most exciting part of that Toastmasters role? Try to get new people to come and join us, come and check our club out. And we've been pretty good about having visitors, so we have visitors almost every week. Now I also see that you've competed in other conferences, yes. table topics, uh, primarily. Yes. What made you try a different context? <laughs> the truth is, my president made me! And what's her name? <laughs> Folks, you see the pattern here? <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very rewarding experience. It is. It is. It's just such an amazing experience. Well, Sherry, thank you very much. Right. So George, which club, how long? Well, I'm in the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois Club. I've been there a couple of years, and I'm proud to say I've reached my half competent designation. competent by the end of this year. So, question is, what inspires you? Answer: Doing good deeds. Does being a spy qualify? <laughs> or good deed. Absolutely, absolutely. As a matter of fact, this is the definition of doing good deed because you're doing it without the accolades and the acknowledgement of others. You're doing it just to do it for, for a good cause. And what's the most memorable? Or so I would believe. Yeah. What's the most memorable good deed you've witnessed in those Well, I think it's great that when people, when presidents or other officers or other members push somebody to achieve something, to do something, like they were pushed up here to speak. Um, when you know that they've got the skill and the capability and they're just a little reluctant, as often is my case, and you need that little push to get you there. Very good. Well, George, thank you so much for competing in. Patrice, <laughs> how long have you been Toastmaster? Which club and has designation? A little over a year. I just completed my CC in September. Yay. Now I see you are a surgeon at arms. Yes. What have you picked up from that role that helps you outside of those meetings? Setting those meetings up, the meeting rooms, being on time, and they change our meeting rooms constantly. <laughs> just learning a lot. Um, leadership role is very important. It's helping me not only in Toastmaster, but it's helping me on my job. I'm able to assist other people when they say, oh, I got to set up a meeting. Oh, I can help you with that. <laughs> and you're in CNA insurance? Yes. What exactly do you do? I am claim operations. 
I pay claims. <laughs> so we have a claim operator next to a smooth operator. <laughs> <laughs> but remember, when you're surgeon at arms, you have to carry a lot of equipment around, right? Yes, I do. But you have a gallon. So next time someone at the gas station asks you, reach for the gallon. <laughs> it's a very powerful weapon. Thank you so much, Latrice, for participating. you've noticed between the art of writing and the art of speaking? You have to be on your toes when you're speaking. It's a lot like improv. You have to be ready for any situation at any time. But with writing, you're on paper, and so you have a little bit more control. Well, Deidre, thank you so much for participating. <laughs> Guys, do you want bonus questions? If you uh <laughs> 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 don't stage time is important. Doesn't matter that you don't speak, still it's stage time. I love it because so next to stage time. Hopefully it gives the confidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to get questions. Yeah, you know, I've been in the most of that since I was like 18. I don't know where I'm at to be honest with you. I'm giving hundreds of speeches. I've competed in every contest every year. It's been probably about 12 or 12 years. Even if I know I'm going to, I just compete because it builds morale, builds. I'm, I'm, I'm a competitor. As you can see an interest here, kickboxing. I love the kickbox, yeah. Uh, it, it's something I can do. <laughs> you know, kickboxing is something that I, 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 you know, I needed a challenge. You know, I recently started a uh, business like uh, four years ago and I got that up and running. And so I needed something that uh, wasn't good that was going to take some work. And so as you can see I got my eyes black right now so uh, so I can kickbox and uh, go after that so maybe uh, 10 months now. Well, yeah. So how do you combine kickboxing and public speaking? <laughs> <laughs> well you know in kickboxing you have to go out and compete even when you know the chances are steep. And even coming you know even I've been speaking for a long time coming in and seeing everybody wants to win, you know. And I'm coming in, I see the guys and like you have to be in the game. You know, I don't, you said how do I combine it, right? I combine it because I use that fear and I channel it over. Because if, if you can stand in the ring with someone who wants to tear your face apart, <laughs> you can come in here and say it. That's a really good speech. <laughs> thank you so much. Back to the stage, our Central North Division Governor, Charles Chapman. Okay, everybody, I said we were going to have a little fun, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lots of great speakers. Now, I want to bring up Miss Donna Weston to help me give out the prizes for our contest today. I'm kind of new at this. I thought I got it. 
Thank you. Whatever. <laughs> something. Something good. I want to thank all our contestants and functionaries. We really appreciate it. I want to also thank Chicago Transit Toastmasters for helping us with this location. This is a nice room. We don't need any special equipment. It's not cold. And our air is not on. We feel good in here. And uh, everybody drive home safely. Thank you.